I'd like to propose the idea that what we see in the epistles is something that was supposed to be presented theatrically in a way that was entertaining, in a way that was fun, in a way that was probably even funny. And so people would get together in their groups and they would mock and ridicule the establishment. If you've heard of the idea of prosopopoeia, it's the idea that there are two conflicting voices in the epistles. And so you have one viewpoint presented and then a response to that viewpoint. And a, I think that touches the surface, but doesn't quite go far enough from what I feel like I see when reading these. Because I see something that most likely was presented in a theatrical manner in which the, you would have either one actor or even possibly two actors presenting this and something would signal a difference between, if it was only one actor, would signal the difference between the two voices. Possibly a quick change of proper costume, change of voice. So f those those kinds of techniques that would tell you a different speaker is speaking, even though you have only one actor. Or you'd have two actors going back and forth. This relates to the idea that originally, if you go at any point in time in history, prior to the development of the movable type printing press, which means you're already talking about the mid 1400s. And then even beyond that point, writing is difficult and expensive. So there's going to be a degree to which you want to be conservative in what you write. Also, literacy was not very widespread. So what you would have most likely is that whoever wrote something down was writing it down knowing how it's to be read because all they're doing is basically having the record of what is to be said or a reminder of what is to be said even. Perhaps not even the, the entirety of it, but just your notes so that you remember what the speech to give is or what the uh, message to give is. So you might have even just had the outline and the framework of it because writing is difficult and expensive. So if you put into your mind the idea that writing is difficult and expensive, it has to influence the way that you see what is written down. Um, partially, there's just this fact that literacy is new. So the techniques that we use in, in modern times of how we write things with such lengthy descriptions is normal to us because writing is cheap and easy and everybody can do it or nearly everybody. Literacy is very widespread. When literacy isn't widespread and it's difficult and expensive to write, you're not going to write very descriptive things. You're going to write just enough. Just as much as is necessary. And that means that you're going to need to read it out loud to people if you're going to give that message to more than just those few who are illiterate to read it in the first place. But also, you know that you're writing it in a manner in which not everything is there. It's not, the whole message isn't there because writing is difficult and expensive. So you, as you are producing the writing, you're teaching people to read the writing. 
you're passing on this is the scribal school where a person who is literate teaches a person to write stuff down for the purpose of reproducing the teaching. So they already know what the teaching is. They're writing down the notes of what's necessary. And this is a framework that I've been kind of thinking of for a long time now in terms of why there's so little description and understanding to these writings. Why it's so easy to read these things and have a multitude of different interpretations of what it might be or what it might mean. And it just kept bouncing off my head. Writing is difficult and expensive. And furthermore, they hadn't developed the process of writing in the ways that we have in our modern society. So we think nothing of writing two pages that's just absolute raw description telling you what the scenery is like, what the smells are like, what the sights and sounds are like. In the gospel accounts, you have three sentences, and that's the whole entire episode. They give you almost no detail at all. And then it might have six sentences because it actually gives a detail or two. And that's not at all how we write today. And it's very sparse. And so I think that's the whole thing. Writing is difficult and expensive. Now, when we get to the epistles, I think not only do we have the concept of prosopopoeia scratching the surface, we have two separate voices that are in conflict with one another. But I think that these were to be presented in a way theatrically that would have been entertaining and would have really lampooned and mocked and ridiculed the establishment that they're working against. So if you have the idea that there's this violent conflict, that these people are subversive, the accusation in the book of Acts that they are spreading a message that is not lawful for Romans and that is blaspheming, the, uh, blaspheming Moses is an accurate accusation. They are subversive to the Roman Empire, and they are subversive to the Law of Moses. So these people are anti-establishment. And one of the things that you do when you're anti-establishment is ridicule the establishment. So they're just the same as we are today. They were producing a form of political and religious satire that would be the equivalent of the things we have today, but kind of less detailed in its record. So I don't even know entirely where I want to go with this topic in general, but I know that I want to look at some here in the book of Romans, and this is something, it, it gets difficult trying to figure out where the dividing line is. So let's go in the book of Romans, and we'll just take a quick piece here, where in Romans 5, if we back up, we see it says, uh, let's just get to the end here. It says, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So it kind of creates this relationship. Sin abounds, grace abounds more than that. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace re uh, reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So now we go to chapter 6 and it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So right here we now have a response to the way that chapter 5 ended. This response says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now it says, God forbid. Okay, so where does this God forbid even fit in? Does that punctuate the response? Or is that the initiation of the response to that response? Here's what I mean. 
let's call it the law voice, the establishment voice, versus the grace voice, the subversive voice. So the, the grace voice was speaking until the end of chapter 5. The law voice responds and says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay, so that's essentially a straw man, first of all. It's a stupid argument. And so I think where it says God forbid and in some translations it says may it never be so or something like that. I think really if we were to accurately re represent that in modern 2019 speech, we would say, well, that's stupid. Or, what? you know, are you a moron? I think would probably... So another way possibly depending on where where it's punctuating is maybe something like that's preposterous so you could have the the law voice saying what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid like that's preposterous that's ridiculous and then the grace voice responds how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein and continues its argument responding to the accusation. Or it might be that the law of voice questions, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the response starts with, don't be a moron. You know that's a straw man argument just as much as I do. So that could be the beginning of the counterpoint is the, the God forbid. So even figuring out where that part fits, is it the punctuation of the accusation or is it the beginning of the counterpoint? It could go either way. And I'm not even convinced that it's the same, that it's, there's consistency throughout. And I think even possibly, maybe it's supposed to throw that little wrench in there. Is that the punctuation of the question or the beginning of the response? How do you know? Because it's there just to kind of go cause you to think like, okay, which part of this is stupid? Which part of this is preposterous? Which part of this is a straw man argument? Which part of this does is not logically sound? So it's not even necessarily the punctuation of one or the beginning of another, but rather a transition between the two of saying, okay, there's something wrong with the argument that's happening here. So here's an accusation saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's interesting is how much this looks like what was already in the book of Romans. And if I can find it, because I might not even be in the right chapter, and I didn't plan this ahead. Ah, here we go. Romans 3, 8. It says, as we be slanderously reported... And as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. So here it's already established that there's a slanderous and false accusation that the proponents of grace are promoting a message that says, let us do evil that good may come. Here's the question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's really just the same exact thing. So it's already been established that's a straw man argument. So what's the response? Come on, man. Don't be a moron. You know that's a straw man as well as I do. That's the response to it. The response is to call it stupid and, and say that's a ridiculous question. Think about that the next time you're about to watch somebody spend 45 minutes on responding to the question of a license to sin or wh however, whatever straw man argument they want to make up. The book of Romans responds to it by saying, that's ridiculous. That is an utterly stupid question. That's the initial part of the response to it is, man, was that ever stupid? What just came out of your mouth? So that's something to consider as well. What is clear, though, is that there's one voice and then a response to it. 
it's really complicated in the book of Romans because there's so much of what what you have is very often this method of saying okay here's your viewpoint now let's expose why your viewpoint doesn't logically conclude with the conclusion that you've got and over and over again it uses this technique where it's not affirming the law of viewpoint but it's taking it and following it through we see this later on with the whole stuff with the predestination and all that stuff and like you're okay, it says basically to summarize, you're okay with the idea that God can do whatever God wants. You think that God's it's God's prerogative to do whatever God wants. So if God wants to harden Pharaoh's heart because that somehow brings him glory, you're cool with that. But then when we tell you God's plan is to include everybody and that he, God loves everybody, all of a sudden, whoa, 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 slow down. You've got an objection to that. So wait a minute, because you think that you don't have any right to object to God. What is the potter or what is the, the clay to say to the potter? Oh, hey, you know, you can't do that. So here again, we're affirming your position. Your position is God can do whatever God wants. Your position is you have no right to object. And here you are objecting to what God is doing. And here you are thinking God can't do what God has done. So that's what's really going on in that whole Romans 9 to 11 thing that gets so twisted up into a ridiculous knot of thinking that a, a viewpoint is being affirmed when really what it's doing and to go through it is very time consuming to go through it point by point. That's just a brief summary is that I'm going to follow your logic and I'm going to follow it to its viewpoint or to its to its conclusion and show how your viewpoint doesn't conclude where you've concluded it. And so this is what's going on in these epistles is this back and forth and this continual let's take your position and let's run it through the ringer. Let's follow it to its logical conclusion and see if it ends up where you think it ends up. That to me is the kind of thing that you would do, that you would get together and that would be fun. That would be fun to get together and let's just utterly rip apart the opposing viewpoint. And we're going to do it in a way that mocks and ridicules these people. So if we take, for example, Romans 7... So now we get we get the same idea again. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Okay, so where does this come in? We have the law voice saying, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Where does the God forbid fit in? I don't know. But it's that bridge, that transition between the law voice and the grace voice. So the grace voice says, I didn't know sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So he basically says, I didn't even know it was wrong to want things that I didn't have until the law told me so. So we continue on down, and he says, So let's take the line, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. That's not being affirmed. That's the position that's being taken. So this is what I'm talking about. Like, let's take your position and follow its conclusion. So if you're going to say that the law is holy and just and good, then let's follow and see what, what, what does the law actually do, what actually comes from the law. So let's back up. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So the commandment revived sin. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good? You see, that should be more of a question. Was that then which is good made death unto me? 
that's ridiculous. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me, that which is good, that sin by the commandment may become exceedingly sinful? If the commandment is holy and just and good, how does it create exceeding sinfulness? How does it create death? How does it strip life away from me? What is good about that? There's something wrong with your interpretation of what you think the law is because it can't be good and produce wickedness. It can't be good and produce exceeding sinfulness. It can't be a ripe, juicy, delicious, healthful fruit and produce thorns and thistles. It doesn't make sense. So let's go back to this question. Is the law sin? Yes! It absolutely is. The law is death. That's the conclusion. So the... the the law voice says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Yes! That's exactly what we shall say. This is interesting too. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what does the law do? It gives you a knowledge of sin. What does that mean? Because let's take the religious interpretation out of it. Sin is not a list of things that you do wrong because here's this list of things you're not allowed to do. That's what the law is. The law is here's this list of things you're not allowed to do. But sin is the mentality that there's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I have shortcomings, and that's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong to be me. That's what sin is. I had not known that I'm a failure until the law told me I'm a failure. I had life until the law told me it's wrong to think the way that you think and to want the things that you want. Is the law sin? The law is the only thing that causes you to say there's something wrong with me. I shouldn't be who I am. Without the law, the mentality that there was something wrong with me was dead. For I was alive without the law. But when the commandment came, this mentality that there's something fundamentally wrong with being me revived and I died. And the commandment which is supposed to be for life, I found to be to death. For this mentality that there's something wrong with me and I'm a failure and I'm not who I should be, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. It was a lie. And by it slew me. Because there is no truth in accusation. So you want to say the law is holy and the commandment holy, just, and good? Then how does it make death? How does it produce death? How does it produce this mentality that I'm a failure? What is good about that? That's what is happening here in Romans 7. So let's get a little more lighthearted here. Let's take this idea that women should stay quiet in church. Women shouldn't be speakers. So we have the law voice. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, if that's possible, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it to you only? <laughs> That's ridiculous. All right, all right. But if any man think himself to be a prophet, right, or spiritual, okay, well then let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 
So what it says basically is you've got this moron saying, let women keep silence in the church. And it says, no, how about you shut up instead? And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when you see that and you see the theatrics of it. 